Okay, so uh, I'm back again, and uh, you'll see me one more time towards the end of the day. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, about controlling distributed energy resources with edge computing in Go. And uh, I'll first talk a little bit about the industry. So um, I'm not sure many of you know what we do, but uh, in SP Digital, we are part of uh, uh, SP Group, right? The SP stands for Singapore Power. So uh, uh, we are basically a utility, right? That is uh, basically it. And uh, the utility industry, the power and energy industry has been changing. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we started up uh, SP Digital. In the days where uh, you have generation, then transmission, distribution, and retail, that's uh, what is current in many countries. But this picture, this landscape is really changing. Uh, there are a lot of things that are up and coming, things like renewable energy. We're talking about solar panels, uh, that's in Singapore and in many parts of the world. But we're also talking about things like wind turbines, uh, hydro, and, and so on and so forth. Um, this is really changing the landscape of the energy industry. Uh, energy storage systems, where in the past electricity, once it's been generated, has to be consumed. This has changed a lot as well. Regulatory changes, utilities are always regulated. Uh, and you know, what is concerned is really just change. Uh, there will always be changes in the uh, regulations. And finally, a lot of uh, technological advances have been uh, happening in the industry. Right. Uh, and that's the reason why we set up this uh, team, SP Digital, uh, which is a part of uh, Singapore Power Group. And our vision is to reimagine sustainability with energy tech. Right. It's, it's a bit of a buzzword here, uh, energy tech. But really what we are trying to do, and the vision of the team, is we want to achieve sustainability. And how we want to do it is through technology. Uh, we call it energy tech. Okay. So let's jump to uh, what we do. Uh, obviously, a technology team, we create technology products, right? Uh, in this case, uh, energy tech products. And we classify the three groups of uh, consumers, our end users, uh, for the nation, right? Because uh, we work for the utility, and the utility really serves the nation. Uh, from consumers, um, in the utility world, consumers are probably the least of what uh, con uh, utilities normally engage with, right? So. Uh, what we want to change that, we want to change how utilities interface with consumers and for businesses as well. So this is really the uh, hidden part of the utility and uh, energy world where you know, uh, 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 commercial and industrial uh, uh, companies like, like this place, for example, today you see the lights all here, right? Uh, so behind all of these things are basically a bunch of people maintaining the uh, equipment, the grid, such that all of these works and uh, the grid then provides to the, the businesses and provides with us with electrification where we all enjoying today. Okay. Uh, but specifically for SP Digital, what we want to try to, to achieve is sustainability. And it's, it's not a, a very uh, fuzzy fuzzy kind of word, it's very targeted. What we are trying to target towards is uh, this United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. There are 17 of them. It's uh, very broad and wide ranging. Of obviously, we don't try to cover everything. Uh, in particular, one of the goals that we try to, to focus is on goal seven, but we also focus on things like uh, uh, innovation and infrastructure, which is the uh, topic of what we're going to talk about, sustainable cities and communities, and so on and so forth. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, really geared towards building a sustainable future for ourselves and also for the, the nation. OK, coming back to what we built. So uh, we built, uh, for the past three years of, uh, of our existence, we have built uh, different technologies. And uh, collectively, we call it an energy tech platform. Today, I'm just going to talk about two of them, which is our IoT platform, as well as our energy platform. Okay, so uh, first off is our IoT platform, uh, secure IoT infrastructure. We focus towards this sustainability goal, which is goal number nine, uh, towards industry innovation and infrastructure. And he has many different components. The main component uh, that we, that's very visible is our SPUG, the SP Universal Gateway. This is an IoT gateway hardware. You can see the picture here. This is uh, something that's been designed by the, the team. It has an operating system, which is a, a hardened Linux kernel. And this pro performs things like device management and uh, cloud connectivity. It has a cloud component. 
uh, a platform which controls it remotely, and also to be able to, to monitor, to uh, send uh, 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 commands as well as uh, 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 applications down to the devices. And finally, we have an app repository where we can able to uh, select the uh, apps and send it down to the gateways. This is the actual hardware itself. It has many different form factors. The one on the, on, on the left, the far most, that's like the, the naked version, right, where we expose the PCB. The one on the right is a Dean Rails version, where we will stick it onto uh, different uh, uh, things within our, our, our facilities. And the one in the middle is just a bunch of sparks that's ready out for rollout. Uh, Deployments-wise, we deployed it to rooftop solar panels uh, in our district offices, in, in energy storage systems. Energy storage systems are essentially large lithium-ion batteries, right? So you have your phone, it's a lithium-ion battery in it. This is like the mega version of it, right? The huge version of it. Uh, we also deploy in our substations and uh, many other locations as well. Some screenshots of the, the system that's been built. And uh, let me move on to Aurora. So that is the infrastructure part of it. Aurora is a customizable energy management system where uh, we built this to uh, uh, deliver energy management capabilities for our, uh, for our customers. The goals, the sustainability development goals we targeted are for affordable and clean energy, the, for infrastructure as well as responsible consumption and production. And uh, <clears throat> in terms of what it does, right, it connects to solar PV. PV is photovoltaic, so these are basically the sonar panels. Uh, to like, summarize it, there are two types of solar. Uh, essentially, the first type is uh, related to thermal, and that's not something that we touch, but uh, we uh, focus more on uh, solar PVs, the photovoltaics. So we uh, use this to monitor and manage the PV installations, use this to manage the energy storage systems, to not just monitor as in extract data, but also to send commands to uh, perform either single or multi-purpose applications. We do energy monitoring. We have our own in-house built EMON devices, and we have uh, various types of customizable interfaces. Uh, we use this for multiple levels, uh, for the engineers who are actually working on the, uh, the ground level for monitoring and so on. We use this for the building management. So, for example, if MBS uses uh, us, which actually, unfortunately they don't, uh, hope not yet, uh, then the building managers would be able to, to use this to, to view the consumption and so on. Uh, and energy managers, people who actually con, um, manage and monitor the uh, energy consumption within a building or within a unit and so on. These are some of the examples. Katunasi is a, one of our, our customers. Uh, this is the screenshot. This is what we call a green wall at one of our other customers, uh, Bukit Panjang Community Club. We, we place it in front of the lift lobby because uh, they want to show off you know, how green they are. Uh, this is one of our uh, programs that we ran internally for energy challenge to challenge each of the uh, district offices to be uh, more sustainable. And these are some of the other equipment that we work with. Okay, so that's uh, enough talking about the product. I will now hand it off to Ruli, who will get down to the details of the technology. Okay, thank you, Sao Siong. My name is Ruli. I'm a software engineer at SP Digital. And for the past years, I've been working on interfacing with energy devices using our Spark platform. If you see this picture, you will recognize a, a very familiar person. That's not me. That's our Mr. MC for today. Okay, I, I would like to start with an overview of the Spark platform. At the heart of the Spark platform is the Spark Cloud. It is the central component that binds all other components together. It serves a few functions. First, on the right-hand side, we have the Sparks, the device. We use the Spark Cloud to manage and monitor the Sparks. We register the Sparks on the Spark Cloud, then we can view the status of the Sparks, whether they are online, offline. We can view the vitals of the Sparks temperature, humidity, we can send remote commands to the Sparks to reboot the Spark or open a secure uh, tunnel to access the console of the Sparks. On the bottom left, we have the H apps or the Spark apps. These are the apps that we can install on the Spark. We register these Spark apps on the Spark Cloud too, then later on we can install it on the Spark. On the top left, 
we have the hub app. These are the cloud apps that are given permissions or allowed to exchange messages with the Spark apps running on the Spark through the Spark cloud. We register these hub apps on the Spark cloud too and we give them a set of permissions. This is how the deployment process looks like. So in each Spark, there's an agent running. When the Spark is turned on, the agent will connect to the Spark cloud and ready to listen for commands from the Spark cloud. When an installation command is received by the agent, the agent will download the Spark apps from the Spark cloud together with the configurations and the credentials. It will, it will load on the Spark and run the apps on the Spark. And another main responsibility of the Spark cloud is to route messages between the hub apps and the Spark apps. The routing of the messages is based on PubSub, so both the hub app and the H apps, they are publishing and subscribing to certain topics on the Spark cloud. Okay, now I want to talk more about the H app the apps running on the Spark. What is an S app? Actually, an S app is just a normal apps compiled for the Spark environment. It's a ARM processor. And we package it as a Docker container. So it can be written in any language, but in SP Digital, we choose to use Go for writing our uh, Spark apps. And one of the immediate benefit of using Go is the smaller package size of the apps because as we know, Go compiles to native executable binary and the Go runtime is already included inside the, the binary. So the package size is relatively smaller and our typical app has a size of about 10 megabytes. We also have another app uh, written in Java for comparison. And for uh, this similar app with similar complexity but written in Java, the app size is about 80 max. So it's about 1 to 8. And this is because we need to package together the Java runtime environment inside the app package. So in edge computing, this is actually quite significant because we want to save on resources, we want to save on storage, memory, and bandwidth. So having a smaller package size is really uh, useful. Oh. Uh, okay. So typically an edge app will perform one of these three functions, data collection, remote control, and local intelligence. Data collection is our main use case. Every day, we collect data from hundreds of different sources uh, across Singapore using different protocols and collecting thousands of data every minute. And because the data collection is our main use case, so we built a data collection framework that will allow us to collect the data from the, the different sources in a consistent manner and also to allow us to easily add new protocols in the future if we need to. So the data collection, we collect data periodically. It is configured from a configuration file to know where to collect, to collect the data from, using what protocols, which data to collect, and how often to collect the data. We support a number of different uh, protocols that is uh, very popular in our field of in our field, industry, uh, energy industry, um, like Modbus, BACnet, OPC UA, and other protocols. And so the data will be collected periodically. Each time the data is collected, the data will go through the data processing stage first, where the data will be labeled, it will be tagged, we can do transformation, scaling, um, offset, and all this. And we can also apply constraints to the data. Then after this, the data will be pushed to a persistent queue. Now, the persistent queue is uh, the essential component in its computing. So unlike the cloud environment that we are used to, where stability, availability, and reliability are generally high, the edge computing 
or edge devices are typically deployed in an environment where we don't have all this high availability or stability or reliability. It can be deployed in a harsh environment. So things can break down. Mm, so power can be cut off at any time. And 3G connections. 3G connections can come and go at any time too. So we need to put a defense mechanism against all of these possible uh, failures. And persistent queue is one of our main uh, defense mechanism to, uh, to help us uh, overcome all these uh, possible failures. Okay, next is that how the data get published. So there's another loop, which is the data publishing loop, and it is decoupled from the data collection loop by the use of the persistent queue. The data publishing loop will take configurations to know where to publish the data to, and using what protocols. Again, we support a number of different protocols, but mostly we publish to our own uh, Spark Cloud. Okay, the second use case that's very common in our industry is to, to do remote control. We want to control devices like the energy storage system to charge or discharge, uh, or we want to limit the output of a PV system by sending a command from the cloud, from the hub site, down to the Spark app site running on the Spark. So at the Spark site, there's a command listener listening for the commands. And uh, when a command is received, it will run actions to control the energy device. The action may take some time to complete. So uh, in between, we can send intermediate results back to the cloud. And finally, when the action completes, we can send the final results back to the Spark Cloud. The third use case is local intelligence. In this use case, we have the Spark app runs locally without the need for input from the, from the cloud. So it will just rely on the local inputs available from the sensors attached to it, and it controls the energy device based on this local input. Sometimes we also need to combine all these uh, functions together, especially for a more uh, advanced use case. For example, if we want to do complex computations, usually com com for complex computations, we don't want to do this on the Spark because the resources is limited. We want to offload these complex computations to the cloud. So the computation will be done on the cloud, then the result will be sent down to the Spark in terms of set points and predictions. And the Spark apps running on the Spark will take these uh, set points and predictions and execute the, ex the actions based on this prediction and set points. Okay, so now the next part is I want to show you a very simple edge app written in Go. Mm, this is a simplified version of our data collection app. So a lot of details has been omitted here for simplicity, but hopefully it can give you a preview of what's going on inside uh, an edge app. So we will try to collect data from a Modbus server, and we will publish this to the Spark Cloud. First, we will build the Modbus client. Modbus is a very popular protocol in our industry. So fortunately, we already have a library that can be used to connect to the Modbus server. So we just build the client using this library, passing in the parameters, and we connect to the Modbus server. In real production code, we need to handle the failures using retry and back off. But in this example, we just simply lock fatal F and exit the app, and the Spark agent later on will restart the app. Next, we build the Spark Cloud client to publish the data to the Spark Cloud. Uh, the Spark Cloud exposes its service as a gRPC interface. So we take the protobuf definition of, this, uh, uh, the, of the Spark Cloud service, and we build or we generate the client stuff from, from this protobuf uh, file definition. We use the client stuff to connect to the Spark Cloud. We pass in parameters and connect. And again, 
in real production code, we need to handle the failures using retry and back off. Next, we initialize a persistent queue. As I mentioned earlier, it's very important to have persistent queue here. And next, we initialize a ticker. This ticker will periodically trigger the data collection loop. Okay, here is the main data collection loop. It's running as a go routine. And we range over the ticker channel. In each tick, we try to read data from the Modbus server using the Modbus client. In this case, we read from the input registers at this address uh, for one register. So if the reading is successful, we will push the read data into the persistent queue. Again, retry and back off it's, if, it's, if it fails. And this is the data publishing loop. It's running in another Go routine. And here we range over the data channel of the persistent queue. For each data that we receive from the data channel, we will put the data into a publish request. We assign topics to it. And we will use the client stop of the Spark Cloud to send this published request to the Spark Cloud. Again, handling it with retry and back off in real production code. Okay, then if the publish is successful, we will send a positive acknowledgement to the, to the persistent queue so that the data can be removed from the persistent queue. Finally, we just let both go routines run and we wait here for the termination. So in real life, we, we, we need to make the code more robust because the last thing we want to avoid is to have the Spark app causing instability to the Spark and causing it to lose connections to the Spark cloud. Because when this happens, then the only thing that we can do is to do on-site recovery and it's very troublesome. So this is something we want to avoid. Okay, so for the closing, I will pass to Sao Xiong. All right, so you heard how we actually built the uh, Spark apps and we deployed out in the field. So you must be wondering, like the Ruli was talking about productions, right? So who has actually used it? So I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of the customers who are currently using it. Uh, Bukit Panjang CC, I talked about it earlier on, and Katunasi, which is a Belgian port operators, and also they operate a bunch of uh, warehouses uh, in Jurong Island. Right? They, they actually operate uh, one of the largest rooftop solar installations in the whole of Singapore. Uh, we have a whole bunch of them in uh, our district offices as well. Um, our largest deployment actually is with uh, Samco Marine. Samco Marine is a shipyard. Uh, we deployed at the uh, Tuas Boulevard Yard, which has uh, the largest single solar rooftop in Southeast Asian uh, sh shipyard. Right? So, their shipyard, uh, we, we installed solar panels on top of it, and uh, we use this platform to control it and uh, help them to maximize their, and also to uh, maintain the uh, uh, energy efficiency for their shipyard. So that's some, those are some of the customers who are really currently in deployment. Uh, we actually have a whole bunch of uh, customers currently in planning. So if you hear some of the news coming out in the uh, newspaper and, and so on and so forth, the Tengah Smart Town, uh, SP Group, the, uh, the parent company of SP Digital, uh, have been partnering with HDB to develop a new uh, smart energy town at Tengah. Uh, we are right smack in the, in the heart of this particular development. Um, Singapore Institute of Technology, which is the, uh, I think they are the fifth university in Singapore. Uh, today they are distributed over many polytechnics and different uh, places in Singapore. Uh, but they are building a new campus in uh, Punggol and uh, we are the master energy planner for the uh, Singapore Institute of Technology. Uh, and we are also the master energy planner for the Pungal Digital District. Right? So that's the uh, uh, collaboration with JTC. Uh, we will be operating the smart grid for business parks in Singapore. So uh, that's basically uh, it for our talk. About a minute or so for questions.
Okay, so the question is about uh, uh, SP is using PubSub pattern. Which text, which what text stack do you use? So uh, for the PubSub, we internally use the Kafka. Hmm. Okay, there's, there's a question about security of the IoT. So, uh, for the, all the communications within the Spark apps and the Hub apps, they are uh, secured through, the, through using the TLS. And it's also based on a certificate, mutual certificate, server certificate, and client search. And also, we deploy this mostly using the private. Uh, access point, private APN. This is another layer of protection. Of course, it's different, different, different level of protections. Uh, okay. So uh, many of the the SP Digital team members are around. So if you have further questions, please approach any one of us. Thank you. <laughs>